First, Professor Ireland, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this interview series. Um, as you know, uh, it's a series uh, uh, related to the history, the, the, the sort of the field of, the, of Christianity, China, China Christianity. And um, we're asking scholars essentially the same five questions. Uh, I'm, I'm now conscious of Confucius who <clears throat> once said, in your thoughts, you should not go astray. But uh, sometimes, you know, <clears throat> our discussion might wander here and there. But just if by some miracle, someone doesn't know who you are, I thought maybe I would just offer a very brief introduction and then go into the first question. Um, first, let me just say how honored we are that you've agreed to be uh, interviewed. Uh, we're delighted, especially because of, well, a, a number of projects that you've, you've accomplished and are still working on. Um, mostly what comes to my mind when I think of, of you is I think of uh, uh, Song Shangjie, I think of uh, John Song, right? And, and you know, the, the great evangelist, revivalist. Uh, and I think in your work, you've, you've sort of mentioned that he was quite a, a humorist, which is something that in my, you know, in, in my years of thinking about John Song, I never really thought of him as someone who makes people double over with laughter. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, we're really happy about your recent book, uh, on John Song, and it's a book that's not on my shelf yet, but I can't wait for it to be and to read that. Um, and then also, you are kind of a, not kind of, you are a pioneer in this, this digital humanities project that, uh, that several of us feel completely incompetent to even attempt. But you've produced this Chinese Christianity posters uh, uh, webpage, which is just astonishing. And I have heard so many rave compliments about how it's opened up new vistas of research for us, given a, 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 a visual dimension to how we think about our scholarship. Um, but then again, I, I think I'm going on even longer than I had hoped to, that our, our point is to uh, hear from you. So let's just go into the first question then. And the first question uh, is, what brought you to the field of China Christianity studies? And then maybe if you want to add to that, um, why are you interested in the particular topics that you've been attracted to? Yeah. Well, first, thanks so much for inviting me into this conversation. I'm the one who feels honored and flattered. It's great to be with you, uh, Professor Clark. Uh, the question about how I got into this, it goes back to 2001. Um, I was living in Taiwan, had a great opportunity for sort of language immersion and a chance to really get involved in studying more deeply Chinese history and culture. And Taiwan, in many ways, stole my heart. But while I was there, I also had the t a lot of opportunities to travel in the mainland. And it in felt like I was entering a parallel but very different universe um, when I would get off the plane in the mainland. And particularly, I'm thinking about the Christian universe. Um, Christianity in Taiwan, it has a distinct vitality. I don't want to shortchange it in any way, but it is a little less than maybe 3% of the population. Um, it's sort of developed a clear sort of class consciousness almost, um, identified with a certain population in, in Taiwan. Um, and when I would go to the mainland, the people who were so... Um, the way they spoke and talked about Christianity was just very different than what I would hear in, in Taiwan. And it became very interesting to me. I was very curious. My first exposures to three self churches or the registered churches were very different from what I had come to expect, kind of probably being reared in particular um, anti-communist propaganda in the United States. I'd come to expect that this couldn't be a real church. It would just sort of be a, a front of the government. To, but to discover, wait, this has more life and vitality probably than my churches in the United States. Uh, it was very exciting. And so all of that um, raised lots of questions for me. And then particularly the type of Christianity that I was experiencing and running into when I was in mainland China seemed to have this still a high revivalistic impulse to it. Um, it seemed somewhat familiar to me. Um, but it was everything I was seeing and encountering was happening so quickly. Um, and the speed at which things were changing between my visits were happening so fast that I felt like I had my face up against something so close, almost my face jammed up against this Christian experience in China that I couldn't see it. It was just a blur. I knew it was there. I was running into it, but I, I needed to step back to see it. 
And so that's really what then prompted me to decide to, to work in this area of China, Chinese studies on per, particularly Chinese Christianity to try to get a grasp. If I could just get enough historical distance, maybe I could see and understand a little bit more what I was experiencing. Um, what, what comes to mind as you, as you, as you talk about that is, is I think most of us who've been to China have experienced a similar kind of juxtaposition between of those of us who've been to Taiwan and China, this similar juxtaposition, but also this idea that there is a vitality in, in the Christian communities in China that we, I, you know, in a, even as an American, right, I seldom see that kind of vitality and thinking right. too about, about, uh, uh, how people like Watchman Nee and John Song, there's a church in, in, in my town of Spokane that is a, a, a descendant. The whole community is Watchman Nee, and right. it's a Chinese church, right? So, um, and, and of course, they're very um, robust and, uh, yeah. uh, right? Well, um, then I guess also, you know, you, you talk about how you get into the field, um, and clearly you've done a, tr a tremendous amount of research in art, posters, and John Song. Have you ever had a, a particular moment uh, that you might describe as a eureka moment or a moment that where, while you're doing your research, it's sort of reframed or redirected the way you think about the topic. Yeah, I can think of three, which I apologize if that's more, but as I try, when you say something like that, how do you weigh these? So I'll, I'll, I'll try to run through them fairly quick. Two related to my research on John Song. One was very early in my research. Um, I was actually taking a class on American Christianity and I, at that time, want, had seen sort of the writing on the wall that I thought working on Song Shangjie was the way to go. This would be a, a window into the Chinese Christianity that I wanted to understand. But I had to take this class in American Christianity. It seemed so far distant. Uh, but I decided, well, all right, the, maybe what I can do is I can explore um, John Song's time in the United States, particularly at Union Seminary, where he famously had this conversion and his modernist professors were so blinded by the true gospel light that they put him in an insane asylum. And I, and I thought, I wanna understand what happened there a little bit more. Um, and so I had contacted Union Theological Seminary to see if I could come down and visit, look at his files. And they said, well, you can visit, but we don't have any file. Um, we don't keep things on students that didn't graduate or didn't even complete um, a year of study. And so I thought, well, I'll go down and I'll just poke around, maybe I can see what professors were talking about at the time and things, but I learned something really valuable, um, Professor Clark, at that point, because by actually going, the archivists who are always overstretched and trying to do things, they actually took time to try to assemble some things, and they had, where they were able to construct a file that had never existed before on John Song, and that was just extraordinary, and it began to open my eyes that the way he had always told the story and his biographers had told the story, was a dramatic simplification, if not um, strong revision of what, what happened. And I would now lend myself more to a, quite a dramatic revision to what happened because the second major eureka moment was when I was able to get my hands on his journal that he kept when he was in the insane asylum there in New York. And um, it was very eye-opening and quite shocking at some levels and confusing, um, I would say as well, but it opened up a new world in, into, his, into his mind and his imagination. Um, the way he, for instance, uh, believed that the Gospel of Mark was a hidden radio schematic that could pick up secret messages from God, and he, he did this really dramatic design. You get to see this emerging in his journals, and you, you just realize that he was brilliant. There's no doubt about it. But he also saw the world in ways that I will probably never fully grasp or understand. Um, and, and so that, that was both exciting and traumatic because you try to figure out how do you make sense out of what most people understood to be nonsense. And so as a scholar, that, that has been a, an ongoing task, I would say. Um, but the third, the third real moment that shifted the direction of my research came in a serendipitous encounter, I was actually speaking at a church. People had asked if I could come and share a little bit about Christianity in China. And when I was done, um, a lady in the congregation came up and she said, uh, Dr. Ireland, maybe you can help me. My grandmother recently died and we've been trying to go through her things. And as we did so, we opened a trunk in her attic 
And as kids, we were always told that we couldn't open that trunk because that was grandpa's trunk. And he had fought in World War II. He'd been in China, um, had survived, had been sent back to the US. And on his train ride back to the East Coast, the train derailed and he died. Um, but his trunk made it back to grandma and she just never wanted to open it, told us never to open it, put it in the, in, up in our attic. But now, of course, we have to go through our thing, so we've opened it, and it, was, it had a number of posters in it, Chinese posters. It must be Christian, because we see crosses on them, and what should we do with them? And I was really excited to hear that there were these posters. I had heard of such things, maybe caught a picture of one or two, in the past, but I knew that they were extremely fragile, very frail, and for them to have some of these posters seemed quite exceptional. So over a year, we met together, talked about what to do with those posters, and eventually those 11 posters became the seed of the uh, digital project that you talked about that you can now see online at ccposters.com mm -hmm. for Chinese Christian posters. Um, and you know, at the time, I, I couldn't believe they had 11 this was more than I could ever dream or imagine. It was quite remarkable to me. Um, but it was then through those that I started reaching out to others, including you, um, and have now been able to assemble from the generosity of many people and the support of the Luce Foundation and the Associ Association for Asian Studies, uh, a site that curates 700 different Chinese Christian posters, both Protestant and Catholic. And But it was that moment of, that you don't expect someone coming to you and saying, here's some material. And they've been so exciting to me because I think like many of us as historians, we have largely been connected to text. Um, and so to understand Chinese Christianity in the 1930s, I would read maybe a sermon from John Sung that someone had um, printed in a magazine, or I could read one of the theological books that Zhao Zichen might write or something like that. But this was an opportunity to go beyond what maybe 300, 500 people were actually reading to experiencing what masses, huge numbers of people were seeing Christianity as. And it gave me all, so it was a, it was a fun way to think about popular Christianity. How were Chinese artists, as many of them were Chinese artists, how were they communicating Christianity to people? What was it that they would want to put into a poster? And so that has been an ongoing joy um, and an unexpected direction of my um, scholarship. You know, this, this uh, makes me want to take our very first tangent. Um, I, I remember a professor used to say to me in the field of the study of China, the whole world, especially China, is a, is a, is a kind of time capsule that we're all discovering all the time. And this, this serendipitous discovery of documents or posters is uh, something that actually you're not the first person to mention this. Um, you know, we'll go someplace and the archivist will say, I didn't even know we had this shoebox full of this material. Um, but, but, you know, uh, thinking about the posters in specific, uh, I, I remember sort of studying church architecture and they use the word the Bible in stone or the catechism in glass. Right. Um, and these posters really remind me of that. You know, the, certainly there are catechisms uh, in, in these posters, there are Bible passages that are sort of represented. Um, I guess I wonder what is, and this is, we'll go to the, we'll get back on track here in a minute, but I can't help but ask what have been the greatest challenges? I'm thinking of vocabulary, um, I'm thinking of the terms that you're, you had to really grasp at understanding different terms. What were the greatest challenges of dealing with these posters and putting them online? Oh, well, maybe if I'm real honest, the technical side, um, I, I don't necessarily have those digital skills, but I was able to surround myself with people who did. So I was able to eliminate the biggest challenge, but I've also told people that my incapacity may have ended up being a gift because I required the people I worked with on the technical side to make it a site that I could use. And so they had to lower the bar considerably. And I, but I think that's been one of the, the successes and makes me proud of the site is that it is rather accessible. But in the actual work of sorting through these posters, I remember there was a time, there was a team of us, there were visiting researchers here at Boston University, some graduate students, and we came together, all of us had been working on the posters, and we decided 
in order to design the website, we have to create categories. Mm -hmm. What are those categories are going to be? What are those tabs? So if someone wants to look for a kind of poster, what are we going to call these things? And boy, we really were wrestling with this and struggling. And I remember there was after about an hour, we were kind of at an impasse and we were sort of saying, well, what else? What else have other people said? What can we use? And then we realized no one. We, we've got to invent the categories ourselves and trust other people to help us refine it later. People will sharpen what we're doing. Um, and it was both an exciting and terrifying moment to realize that we were sort of really out on that time capsule of discovery. We were unearthing something people hadn't really taken seriously um, in the last 80 years. And so we were sort of beginning to define, okay, this is an evangelism poster. This is um, a, a Christian instruction poster, or this is just a biblical story poster, whatever label we might come up with. Um, it, it was, that was a fun frontier moment, I would say for us. One interesting thing about that is that often when, when scholars create these nomenclatures, uh, you know, as, uh, as an avant-garde kind of uh, project, those nomenclatures end up sticking. <laughs> so so, um, so it, it's interesting that what you, the work that you've done on that probably will, will, will create almost a way we think of it, of, the, of images in a, in a canonical way. Um, right. Well, uh, so let me just move to the third question then. And, and you know, we've, the question is if, if you could recall a particularly meaningful moment that you've had while researching in a certain place. Uh, some have selected China, uh, some have selected an archive someplace yeah. in the US. Right. Um, but but do, you, do you recall a specific experience that you've had that was, that was meaningful while you were sort of on task as a researcher? Mm -hmm. I do. Um, there are a number, but one that has always sort of been special. It was just such a unique kind of experience was actually when I was in East Malaysia. So on the island of Borneo, um, I was working with um, a Chinese community there uh, that where John Song had visited. And they knew I was coming and I was coming to work in their archives and they had a theological college that had a nice little collection of some manuscripts and some histories that I was very interested in. And uh, they had suggested I come for a week. And so I did that and they took such good care of me. I was picked up at the airport. I was ushered around. I was taken to all these various churches where John Song had spoken. And it was all very exciting. And I was very grateful for their generosity as hosts. But I kept saying, um, you know, when will I have a chance to see the material? And they would say, oh, well, you, you know, we, we can get there maybe tomorrow, but let's first go and, and meet this other person because he actually heard John Song preach. So you'll want to talk to him. And which was great. I enjoyed it. But I there was this nagging anxiety about what about the week of material and we were using up the days quickly here. I think we were on day six when they wanted to take me out um, more into uh, uh, sort of the bush and experience a long house and they, they were very excited about it. And I finally said, I really am concerned that I need to spend some time on, on, in the library and do some research. And they graciously let me do that. So I puttered around. But what was interesting is later that afternoon, they said, why don't you take a break and come over? Um, one of them in particular uh, had done a lot of local history, the local historian. He said, why don't you come to my office? And well, let's just have a, a tea break together. And so I, I did that. And we were sipping tea and he was asking me what I found. And I said, well, you know, I found a couple of things here and there. I'm a little nervous. Maybe if I had more time, I would turn things up. But while we were drinking tea, someone came in um, and he introduced this person. That person would say hi and put some things over on the table and sat down and we would chat a little. And then 10 minutes later, someone else would come in and again, greet me, put some stuff down on the table and we would drink tea together. And this went on for, I don't know, maybe an hour till there were about 13, 14 people in the room. And then he turned back the conversation to my research on John Song and he said, well, we've assembled um, from all the people that we know who had anything, everything we have on the island on John Song, and it's here on the table for you. Um, we've also made, this has all been photocopied, so you can take it all with you. These are photocopies 
Um, we've just enjoyed having you here on the island. And it was amazing. I, it was one of the richest archive resources and I did nothing for it. It was just this gift of generosity from an amazing group of people. It sounds like uh, you've, had, you've had the gift of having people in a way do your work for you. I mean, I don't mean that in a, a pejorative sense, but an archivist who compiles a packet, uh, islanders who compile documents and photocopy them for you. Right, right. Oh, it, it, it's been amazing. I, I owe everything to so many people, as most of us do, I am sure. Um, we, we realize the many debts, but yes, it's very true. I've been the recipient of great generosity and, and con, uh, consistent feedback and help from others. Now, um, <clears throat> so there, there are a few more questions. Uh, the, we've obviously, we're most interested in hearing uh, from you about yourself and your own experience and, and your own life in the field. But we've asked everyone to talk about another scholar um, to uh, reflect upon maybe someone, another researcher in the field and someone else who may have, you may have a memory of that you think is important to the field. So I wonder if you have such a memory. Mm -hmm. This is, this is a tough one because there are so many wonderful people who work in our area. It's just been an amazing experience. Maybe I'll sneak in a couple of short stories. Um, one, my very first was with Daniel Bayes. Um, I had come back from China and thought, okay, this is the direction I want to go. I want to learn more about Chinese Christianity. He was the only name. Um, I knew. And so I reached out to him. He at that point had um, just retired from Calvin. And um, he was extraordinarily generous with his time, um, with advice. And when he was traveling through my town, he even contacted me and said, let's get coffee together. And we had a wonderful conversation. And somewhere in that time, I had, I sort of apologized. I said, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm kind of clinging. I keep taking every question I have to you, but you're the only person I know who's working in, it, in this. And, you know, it was a, a confession of my own narrow limits at the time, but his response was so generous. He said, well, I hope one of my goals is to, with you, at least add one more person to the field. There was a sense of, let's, we can always add, we can grow. This isn't territorial. Um, there's plenty of space here. And he was just so generous with his, with his advice and his welcome. Um, and I, I've been always grateful to that. And of course, he's on my mind because of his recent passing. Yeah. And maybe for the, the same reason, that sense of exchange and, and sharing. Uh, Gary Tiedemann and I didn't have a lot of interaction, but I remember um, just a little bit how he very without any sense of presumption, but as a, a graduate student, he sent me a little email and he said, I believe you're in Boston and I think the Boston Globe has an obituary from, I don't know, 1954 of a missionary. She was, a, a, she was blind and had a long career. And I would love if you could, if you would just pass that along for me. And it was, it was, it was wonderful in a sense to have that someone of, uh, of his research standing and caliber yet to say, hey, could you just do a, a short little legwork for me? And it, it was easy to do and fun to do. But again, that sense that we're a community that we can ask each other for help, I have found to be so true time and again, um, just a, a sense of support. And even I would say maybe mercy. And, uh, and here I'm thinking early on in my work on John Sung, I w was in a panel and I was talking about some of my findings about his healing ministry in particular. And our chair of that meeting was Lian Chi, who's now at Duke. And I probably was young and maybe a little too big for my britches and wanted to say that, show that I could do different research than what he had done. And so tried to challenge him at some of his points. And um, he was so gracious just an extraordinarily gentle, gracious man. And in fact, um, I've since modified and come much closer to what he originally said about John Sung's healing ministry. But even without that, he was, he's always been supportive of my work in John Sung and has graciously put a blurb on the book. And it, it, there's just this sense of, we, uh, we're friends. This is a group of friends and I've treasured that. Um, I know from my colleagues in other areas that it's not always that way. 
it can be much more competitive and almost cutthroat. Who can get to something first and stake out their territory? Whereas here, as in the poster project, it was people like you, Professor Clark, who said, oh yeah, we've got images that we can share. And th this grand generosity to, to a larger project than just our own maybe personal goals has been really remarkable. Right, and it's so interesting that you mentioned specifically Dan Bays and Gary Tiedemann because it, it was largely those two, the passing of those two great scholars yeah. that inspired us to do this interview series. We thought, well, mm -hmm. we better do this right away while everyone knows how to use Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> and and while we're still you know kind of fresh and robust and sort of uh, in lockdown at home well um let me ask you uh the sort of the quote unquote last question and then i have another one but um and it's interesting too because uh some of the scholars have considered themselves to be in themselves emergent scholars but but i would say um Professor Ireland, you know, you've, you've published and you've done so much work already. Um, you're definitely established. And many scholars who are still in, are grad students, they would, they ask me, will you ask the more established scholars what their hopes are for the field? Mm -hmm. um, because as you know, this really wasn't a field until just right. the last few decades, thanks to right. largely Dan Bays, yeah. um, who in a way, I think, defined this as its own of field. <clears throat> but I guess then, could you reflect on your hopes, sort of expectations, what you think, what do you think the, what do you hope, I guess, the field will become in future right. decades? Right. That's a great question. And I think we're probably at a good point to be asking that. Um, and so I, I, I'll be eager to hear what others have been saying on this. Mine may be rooted in a in a short vision at the moment, I've been working very hard this summer on a, a grant um, to work on mapping Christianity in China between 1550 and 1950, and um, not just sort of geographic maps, but also social network maps. And, um, and as I'm working with that, for, with Professor Minigan here at Boston University, we have realized one of our greatest obstacles in communicating our vision to others is that Chinese Christianity, although it's sort of gotten its foot in the door as part of Chinese studies, many people still perceive it as um, foreign to China, as an imperial project, that why would you be interested in this? Um, it's, it's sort of an extension of maybe American studies or European studies, and hasn't been able to, I think, fully be received as um, part of China, that Christianity is a vital part of the story of, of China itself. And I would love to see a growing acceptance where I don't have to spend as much time trying to convince people of that, um, losing precious space in my grant application, trying to convince people of that and get into the meat of why this is so valuable, whether we're talking about conversations around science and math or technology or new the cross fertilization of religious ideas there's just so many things that are at the center of the story of christianity in china that um it, it, i would love to see a, a wider embrace of that and an acceptance that this isn't the full story of china but it's certainly an important part of the story of china Right. Uh, that, yeah. No, I think you, you actually have touched upon something that several people share, um, that they share that same sentiment, that very much that same sentiment. And it, it, it sort of makes me think now I have another question I'd like to ask you, because we have about 10 minutes left. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in the sort of, in the vein of recognizing this as a field um, and, in a, and a significant one, you've mentioned your archival work. And I wonder if you've ever experienced, as I think many of us have, a realization that Chinese Christian or missionary archives contain an enormous amount of information that people who aren't interested in this topic are overlooking. Have you ever had that kind of thought or experience? Oh, for sure. It's just amazing as you work through these documents, how you, I, th I think, what, I don't know what maybe people imagine missionary documents are like. Maybe they, they think it's just a long list of theological comments 
uh, divorced from life uh, in China. But what you gain are all kinds of pictures of daily life, um, social arrangements. Um, I've, I had the joy of uncovering through sort of missionary ignorance, they had stumbled into what one anthropologist has called sort of the um, community of women that often had emerged in a village and how they had unintentionally created an alternative space for these women who only had periodically been able to meet, usually around seasonal cycles of farming. Um, the, the church was able to move that indoors and regularize it and give these women new sources of power. Now the missionaries didn't realize it, but when you knew the anthropological literature about women and how they had already organized in villages, you saw how they were capitalizing on some of these Christian opportunities to be able to meet together, to resolve family conflicts in the village in ways that hadn't always been possible before because they now had this building and sanction to actually meet. And, and so there's just so much more to understand than a, a list of theological ideas or how many people attended the, the, the meeting. You're learning about how, um, what happens when something like a, a movie is first shown um, in, in China, or it, it's, it just goes on and on. They're, they're joy to, to look through um, the, these sources. And absolutely, I think that people I'm finding are starting to realize that these are gold mines. Um, and, and that if you limit yourself, particularly if you're thinking from a Western perspective to um, government, you know, British, colonial office reports, you are missing so much detail. Um, you might have some nice numbers that you can throw in to talk about some statistics, but the day-to-day -day reality of what was happening on the ground, it's rich when you walk into it like a mission archive. Yeah, I just, well, I, how, how wonderfully you put that. I've often thought that uh, there were more missionaries than diplomats in China. Right. And so the missionary archives are much larger than the diplomatic archives, but most scholars have most scholars have only worked in the diplomatic archives, so they're missing the majority of the material. Um, well, let me just let me ask one final question before we end here in just a few minutes, and that is, um, what next for you in your sort of professional uh, intellectual work? Yeah. Well, I. Oh, I hinted at it about this grant that I am working on with Professor Minigan and a doctoral student here at Boston University, Alex Mayfield. And that is a really ambitious project that we openly acknowledge as ambitious, where we are trying to map where every church, school, hospital, orphanage, publishing house, convent, monastery, opium clinic, whatever it might be that was associated with Christianity was located in China um, between 1550 and 1950 making it digitally available. So you can sort of do a sliding scale. You can watch it grow. You can narrow in on a particular province, see how things grew along a river or were blocked by mountain ranges, however you want to, to splice that data. But it's not just being able to map it, maybe begin to see the density of um, where Christ, the Christian presence was, but also really locating who was inside those buildings. So who were the nuns in that convent? Who were the teachers at that school? And through that, being able to see social networks that we didn't realize these people were interacting with one another, or all these people went to this conference in 1911, or you know, that, that we're beginning to see bonds and ties that just weren't perception. Uh, we uh, just, we, there was no way to perceive them before. And it's been fantastic to, to be able to start visualizing and quantifying, I think, the presence of Christianity in China. Um, in a way that moves us beyond the narrow in-depth studies that we've been able to do, which are so valuable. And I don't want, those are our bedrock, but this allows us to get a meta level um, that has not existed before. I'm really excited about the possibilities that open up. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you're interested, if, you, if someone wants to know what was the Christian involvement in the spread of literacy among ordinary Chinese girls? you can begin to isolate the elementary schools and see when they started, where they started, how many were they. And I, I think this is going to be potentially very transformative for how we see the, the place of Christianity in China um, and the networks that tied everyone together. See, this ambition is connected to your last answer, and that is 
how particularly collaborative and friendly this field is. Um, and, and the project that you mentioned is one that will undoubtedly require a great deal of collaboration. I also want to say, before we sign off, I think your future is going to be Excel spreadsheets and maps. <laughs> if there's no future about it, it already is. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm buried in them. It's absolutely true. But I, let me pick up especially on the collaboration piece. By no stretch of the imagination is this my project or Professor Minigan's project. We are working with universities, libraries, and archives all over the world. And the interest in this has been remarkable and the willingness to participate. Uh, just recently, Renmin University in China has put money into it them themselves so that they can help invest and add data to this. It's just others are volunteering hours of saying, well, I've got a collection of material that I, I would love to put up on a map somewhere. Um, so it's been wonderful to see an, a large group of people be able to come together. And that's the way this has to work, I think. They're, I, I, I'm optimistic about this group of Chinese Christians, scholars of Chinese Christianity, just because they're so much that we can share it together and do share it together. Right, right. Well, with that, I think we're just about at that moment. Um, thank you so much. Um, and and, and I, I just want to take this chance to, uh, to say uh, that personally, I'm so grateful to your, your, your work and your contribution. Um, so often we keep books, you know, near us. I'm not in my home office now, but when I'm in my home office, so many of the people I've, I've gotten to know and have, have, have had these marvelous discussions with, their books are near my elbow um, day in and day out. And so just thank you for your part in, cre in creating such a wonderful uh, uh, field and, and making such a great contribution to it. So thank you so much. And we've appreciated chatting with you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.